helpful. This is actually the third week in our series in the book of Genesis we're calling In the Beginning. And in the first week, we saw God create the cosmos. We saw God create everything, the universe. And then last week, we studied specifically the creation of man and how man bears the mark of God. The image of God is in man, something called the Imago Dei, that you and I are created, men and women created in his image. And we kind of grappled with that reality, the creation of all things and then the creation of men and women. And then this week, I think if we didn't know already or I hadn't said, if I asked you, okay, the creation of all things and then the creation of men and women, what do you think is going to come next in Genesis? I don't think, if we're honest, many of us would say marriage. That's what the natural thing flows. It feels like that might be down the line, but that marriage would come so soon to a pre-fall world. You see, next week we're going to study how sin enters into the world, but we're going to see this week marriage existed even before sin. And so this morning, as we study these people called Adam and Eve and what it means to be married, it's just going to be a few short verses, but they're going to be so foundational for us that I think they can teach us a lot this morning. So we're going to be in Genesis 2. We're going to start in 15 and go all the way till the end of the chapter. It said, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. And the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone, so we will make him a helper, so I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living thing, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the sky and the wild animals. But for Adam, there was no suitable helper found. So the Lord God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, and then he closed up the place with flesh, and then the Lord God made woman from the rib he had taken out of man. And he brought her to man, and Adam said, now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife Eve were both naked and they felt no shame. At the beginning of chapter 2, it's just a recap of some of the creation narrative, which we've already covered in good detail. And it talks about God forming the Garden of Eden, which many of you are familiar with, but there's this idea of this garden where God dwells with his creation on earth. And he puts Adam there, and Adam's job is to tend the garden to work the garden. He is the keeper of the land. And it's interesting to me that so often we look at work as a result of sin, this thing we have to do, but Adam was given work even before sin. Now we'll talk about next week what comes as a result of sin, which is toil and the curse on our work. But work in itself was not a bad thing. He gives man a job to do, tend the garden, and Adam potentially then has the coolest job ever. He gets to name all the animals. I have no idea what this looked like, but I just imagine that God paraded the animals by and Adam was a creative guy and just starts throwing out giraffe, zebra, platypus. I don't know how it all went, but in the midst of that, the text tells us that no suitable helper was found, which makes sense. God had said, it is not good for man to be alone So I'll make him a helper. And then he brings by the animals almost to say, will some of these be a helper for the man? But none of them were like man. None of them could relate. Adam wasn't going to find help in a hawk or a horse. There was no fellowship with a bluegill or a blue whale. And while Adam had perfect communion with God, God still looked at animal and said, it is not good for man to be alone for man is not god he is not an angel there's something within adam that longed for connection and creation 
So we see God creates woman. A unique and new creation made like man, but different. Like Adam, but his opposite and his equal, his helper. Someone to be with him, to rule and to care for the garden. Now, I saw a video a while back on the internet, and people get mad on the internet for everything, and this woman was saying, stop calling me my husband's helper. She didn't like the term. She said, it makes me sound like a toddler, like you tell your little four-year-old, like, well, aren't you my helper, kind of thing. She said, I'm not my husband's helper. And I said, well, that's the actual word, so I'm going to say it, because I'm going to say that God just has an idea on words better than Craig, But we take offense at this idea of helper until you understand its etymology. The Holy Spirit is called the helper to us. So unless any of you have looked at the Holy Spirit's role in your life and the way it gives you aid, the way it brings conviction, the way it comes alongside you, the way it gives you strength and energy and said, oh, isn't that cute? The third member of the triune God's my little helper. Then you should not feel any offense to this idea Helper was not this idea that we will make this woman subservient to man. No, she has made it as a co-equal to steward creation. In fact, she would have a unique role where Adam is told, Adam and Eve are told in the beginning, you have two jobs, to rule this earth and fill this earth. The woman would have, obviously, a very unique and special role in filling the earth. So Adam has brought this helper, this same word as the Holy Spirit, And they form this new union. And then we get this piece of scripture that says, That is why a man shall leave his father and mother, the idea of a man setting out on his own to start a new family. Kids and men, even until their 30s or 40s, they would have been under their parents' care we look at 18 sometimes as that cut off, and some of you got a mid-20-year-old living with you, and you're like, mm, it didn't work for me. But we look at 18 as the legal cutoff. In this culture, you stayed with mom and dad until you went to start your new family. And so Moses says that when you leave your father and mother, that is when you will unite with your wife, and you will become one flesh. You will become a new family. And Moses gives us two specific things that Adam and Eve do, and then there's one specific result. That's why I highlighted them. The first thing they do is leave their father and mother and unite to his wife. Obviously, Adam and Eve didn't have father and mother, but you and I do. And then second, they become one flesh. That's the things they do. Those are the actions they take. And then as a result, they were naked And they felt no shame. And because there was no sin in the garden, we can look at this idea of marriage and we can study it this morning and say, what does it have for us? Just in these short verses, what can you and I learn? How can this teach us about what marriage is? And while they're just short verses, they are foundational to a healthy marriage, whether you realize it or not. If this is how God designed marriage in the beginning, you and I should take note. Whether you're married and you can take note present day, or whether you might get married someday and you will need to take note in the future, or whether you'll stay single and you'll be around a bunch of crazy married people, and you can give counsel and biblical wisdom. So what do we see again? The first thing the text says, a man should leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Now Moses is giving this as practical instruction, not because that's what Adam had to do, leave his father and mother, but rather what you and I have to do. That a man will leave his father and mother. This needs to be viewed and then unite to his wife. This is a singular view. Leaving and uniting. That's a one action that happens to them. Leave the parents, unite to wife. Leave the parents, unite to husband. There was a direct purpose and leaving and uniting with one another. And that was to establish a new home. So what does this mean practically? This whole sermon, I'm going to try and teach you the theological end, and then we're going to bounce back into the practical end. It means if a man and woman aren't ready to leave their parents' direct care, they're not ready to be married. 
Just, just very practically, if a man or woman is not ready to leave mom and dad's direct care, they say, I still need cared for by my mother and father. I'm not ready to provide for my own. I'm not ready to establish my own family. Then practically speaking, they're not ready to be married, at least from the biblical sense. And it's not an age thing, but rather a state of being. Now, to be clear, this doesn't mean that if someone comes back to live with their parents and they're married because of transition or because of money issues, that suddenly it's like, well, you're living in my house. That means you're not married. That's a different kind of reality. But rather, this is about the internal willingness to leave the protection of mom and dad. I would argue to leave the financial stability of mom and dad and to form a new family. I did a wedding yesterday, Marcus and Shayla Banks. And the Banks family became a new family. A husband and wife leaving their mother and father, father walking his daughter down the aisle, handing her over, not in a property sense, but in a, this is my care, this is the one I've been charged to look out for, this is the one I've protected, now this is your job, Marcus, this is your new family, as they come together. We see this, but this is a really, really important idea. It's foundational. And some of us take it for granted, but we shouldn't. Why? Because you cannot unite with your spouse until you leave your parents. So there was a two-step. It was a one-step deal, but you needed to leave mom and dad, unite with your spouse. And if you have not left mom and dad, you cannot unite with your spouse. And if I could step on some toes this morning, and I'm going to do it quite a bit. Um, some of you have three people in your marriage. You got a husband, you got a wife, and for most of you, you got a mom. You got a mother-in-law, or you got a mom. Now, I would say dads, but let's just be honest, it's typically not. We're just being frank. And because of that, you cannot actually be united with your spouse. Because there's three people in the marriage, and one of you is brought in, or maybe both of you, maybe there's four people, there's multiple family members in it, and one of you is brought in unhealthy situations from your family of origin, and it's caused chaos, and it's caused drama in your marriage. A marriage is to be a new unit with no entanglements, a clean break, and a new marriage can't form until the old bond is cut off. I mean, that's truly why the father was to give away his daughter. And I'm not trying to talk about it in an ownership sense, but there is this biblical idea of fathers are to look over their children, to be there and to care for them. And so on the, her wedding day, he would walk her down and that he would take the groom's hand and say, this is your responsibility now. I'm giving you the spiritual responsibility and the practical responsibility of caring for my daughter. You now have that obligation before the Lord. It doesn't mean you don't have your mom and dad. The father doesn't sit down and suddenly say, I have no daughter anymore. But we're still called to honor and respect our parents. But leaving mom and dad is far more than physical. Just moving out of their home. Many of you have moved out of your parents' home physically, but some of you have never moved out of your parents' home emotionally or financially. And it must change or it will infect your relationship. Again, let me get really practical. Husbands, there should never be any question of where your loyalties lie, your wife or your mom. You need to hear this clearly. It is 100% of the time your wife. Period. End of story. And I know some of you are thinking, that's going to make mom so Yes, it will. But you know who it's making mad now? Your wife. There should be no question in your mind where your loyalties lie. There should be no question in your wife's mind where your loyalties lie. There should be no question in your mother's mind, if you have to make it crystal clear, where your loyalties lie. Now, please hear me. This doesn't mean disrespect for mom. This doesn't mean that you can't serve mom, but wife should come first. 
She must be a one. And that line shouldn't even be blurry. There should be no question because you are in a new home. I cannot tell you how many counseling sessions I've sat in where I see the husband grappling with this reality of how do I make mom happy and how do I make my wife happy? It usually happens around Thanksgiving and Christmas. Husbands, you with me? And mom calls and it's like, you will be coming over for this. And the wife's like, we're not going over for that. And the husband's like, I'm going to go to the garage for three months and we'll just see y'all in January. I don't know what's happening right now. And I've seen husbands grappling with this reality and far too often choosing their mom at the expense of their wife. This isn't just my opinion. Y'all can see the text this morning. You can see if I'm out on some ledge. It literally says you must leave your father and mother and unite to your wife. You were to form a new home. You must leave them. Ladies, let's get real practical. I've punched your husband around a little bit, so let's swing it the other way. Your mom should not know all of your husband's faults and foibles. Mm -hmm. Your mom shouldn't know every single time you and your husband have a disagreement. Your mom shouldn't be your only confidant. That is now his mother-in-law, not just your mom. My wife is as close with my mother-in-law as ever. But if I knew that she was going to her every time we had a disagreement, you know how uncomfortable that would be for me? You know how disrespectful that would be for me that everything I say goes to my mother-in-law? I cannot tell you how many counseling situations I've sat in where the wife is oversharing in over unhealthy ways with her mother and uses the justification, my mom is my best friend but your husband is your husband. And if in sharing with your mom, your husband feels disrespected and unloved, you're bringing someone else into the unity. Leaving parents can be really difficult, huh? I've been married 13 years. I've dealt with this firsthand. It can be very tough, but it is the first step in being united. This can be really, really hard but if you simply take the route through the woods of if I have to hurt feelings, it will be mom and dad's rather than spouses, it will get you to a stronger place. Now let me step on some other toes. Parents, get out of your kids' marriages. If you're in the situation where your spouse or your kids call you up and share every detail that's going on in their marriage, you need to stop them. You need to have the boldness to say, I don't know that that's healthy. I don't know that I'll be able to look at my son-in-law or daughter-in-law the same way if you share that with me. So, so I can love them well, I don't want to know that information. I just want to be there to support you, to pray for you, to care for you, but I don't need to know every single time they make a mistake. I know that's going to be true if my Elsie ever gets married. There's not going to be a guy good enough for her. So when that idiot makes a mistake, I don't want to hear about it. I want him to pray, I want him to repent, I want him to get with Jesus, and I'll keep praying for him, but I don't need to hear about it every single time because that's my baby girl, and I'm going to have a frustration with that, right? So parents, stay out of their business. Try and be a blessing to them. If you know, if you felt a little bit of tension where you're like, well, I just want my kids to come over on Thanksgiving, and I didn't know it would cause a fight. You felt that tension? Be a blessing to them. To say we love you I know you've got multiple families to honor we'd love to spend time with you however that looks and whenever that looks we just want to be with you so however you can bless us with that we look forward to it I share that with you because I want you to know your kids will reciprocate in kind when you bring blessing to them when you honor their family boundaries they're going to be far more likely to want to interact with your family because you respect their new unit because when they come, they're treated as a son and daughter, loved as equal children, and brought into your home. Your goal as parents should be for your kids to have the best kind of marriage. Don't we all hope that for our children? That they would have the best kind of marriage? Far be it from us to be the one that inserts themselves into our children's marriage and causes difficulty or strife. They need 
to have unity and become one flesh. And without unity, they will not move on to that second point because that's what Moses says. You're going to leave mom and dad. You're going to become united as a new couple. And then you're going to become one flesh. Now, this meant physically, specifically in Genesis 2, this meant Adam and Eve had sex and they were united literally as one. But this idea of becoming one in marriage is far more profound than just a physical act. Oneness calls husbands and wives out of individualism and selfishness. The idea of oneness in marriage calls husbands and wives to being a team together and establishing a unit where it's no longer about what is best for you personally, rather it's what's best for the team what's best for the marriage, what's best for the family. Rather, you begin to process when you start to think through oneness about how you will sacrifice personally what is advantageous for you to make your union and your home stronger. A marriage without healthy striving for oneness in all areas and dimensions of their lives, specifically spiritual, emotional, and physical, will falter. Because we need to hear this, despite what 2022 tells us, marriage was never meant to just be two roommates. It was never meant to be a business interaction. I know we register our marriages with the state, but marriage existed long before the state of Ohio. Amen? We're seeing this. Marriage was always meant to be a spiritual union between two people, and we have sometimes professionalized them into really, really good roommate relationships. Let me be crystal clear about something, as, this though, as though I've been vague somehow today. <laughs> if you want to be independent and a lone ranger and do your own thing, do not get married. If you are single in this room and you're constantly saying, I'm all about me, I want to go where I want to go, I want to do what I want to do, it's about what I want, stay single. There's nothing wrong with that. Jesus Christ was single. Paul actually says it's better for you to stay single. So there's nothing wrong with staying single. If you feel like that, I'm independent, I don't want to share my life with another, don't sign up to say, I want to be one with another. But if you're already married, you're signed up. You're in the camp. It is time to be one. And when you fight oneness, your marriage will falter because it will feel like a roommate you maybe share a bed with. When you live in a cycle of self-sacrificing love and move towards oneness, it will be like an actual marriage. To be clear, it won't be perfect. It certainly won't be easy. But oneness is the track you can take together. Anytime the topic of marriage comes up in the scriptures, I'm keenly aware that there are many, even in this room, certainly watching online, who are struggling in their marriage right now. And if you're struggling, it's likely because you feel disconnected from your partner, either emotionally, spiritually, physically, and you're not feeling one in one of those areas. And being one can feel like this super spiritual thing and not very practical. So I want to give you an example of what oneness looks like in my family on a regular basis. On Thursday nights, after a long week, what does oneness look like? It's not this natural, natural spiritual thing. It's not me leading a Bible study and reading scripture over my wife and praying for her. Oneness in the Flack household looks like giving baths and doing bedtime stories. A day-to-day a day -day way for me to choose oneness with my wife is being an active father and parenting my kids alongside Becca. Because let's be honest, my children far prefer my wife. At bedtime, they're, they know enough to not hurt my feelings now, but they don't want me to do bed. Becca's way better at it. I have a lot more rules. Dad's way less fun. I admit it. But you know who doesn't want to do all the beds and bath times? My wife. If I want to love her well, I help her with those things. They're my children. I parent actively alongside her. And if I can just be very honest with you, 
Most nights, I want to sit in my chair, I want to watch TV, because I've been at the office all day, I've been working all day, I'm tired, I, I mow the lawn, I did whatever, and the last thing I feel like doing is giving a bath and bending down on my knees and bathing the five-year-old and, and putting them in the pajamas and going through the bedtime routine and getting the cup of water and brushing the teeth and doing all that. It makes me tired just saying it. I want to just sit in my chair. The kids want me to just sit in my chair. Three out of the four people want me to sit in my chair. God's word calls me to get up and to love my wife and to be one with her and to share that with her and to get involved and to be there. And it might feel silly, but sometimes we think of oneness as this grand prize. We think of it as the new car with a big bow. The reality is big one-time gestures are easy. Day-to-day -day marriage is made in the grind. Day-to-day -day marriage is made in bath time and bedtime and grocery shopping and laundry and helping out around the home and working hard and not overspending so that you can make sure your financial goals are met together and being one. It's millions of little day-to-day -day decisions that add up into a marriage. It's easy to plan a big date night and feel romantic and if your marriage is struggling and faltering, you might plan this great weekend getaway, and then you'll return home and you'll realize your problems were right there when you left them. Because you didn't need just two nights away, though that might help. You needed to come alongside one another, to care for one another, to listen to one another, and practically serve one another in the day-to-day -day life. That is oneness. It's actually not very spiritual. Just like love, it's a choice that we make every single day. I'm not sure what ways you're acting like two rather than one in your home and in your marriage right now. They'll be plentiful in your union, and while I might help with bath and bed, there are ways that I act like two rather than one, and all of us have that. But you should know that it is impossible to move to our final goal or our final landing pad if we're not one. Moses gives us this final idea of being naked and unashamed. That if we leave our parents and unite to our spouse and become one, we will lead, it will lead to being naked and unashamed. When oneness goes sideways, when we aren't doing the things we aren't, the first thing we start to do is hide ourselves from our spouse. We cover up. We're no longer naked before them, and I don't mean that physically. I mean that emotionally, I mean that spiritually. You've all felt it. You start pulling back from that person. We become ashamed of how we feel, or we don't feel like we want to be one with that person, and we begin to flee the idea of vulnerability, of nakedness with our spouse, and we cover up. We cover up emotionally, we cover up physically, we cover up spiritually. We don't want them to see what's really going on. Marriage was to be a relationship where you were fully known and loved. But because sin entered the picture, all of us have thought at some point, if they really knew the real me, they wouldn't love me. Or if they really knew me, they would leave me. Each of us have had thoughts, actions, and missteps that we're ashamed of as a married person. And because of that, shame causes us to hide. I'm going to talk about that in detail next week when we look at Genesis 3. Shame tells us to keep that part of us a secret, to keep that part of us dark, to not let anyone know about it. But the greatest enemy of oneness is shame. And it's impossible to be one with your spouse when you're covering up from them, when you're fleeing from them. Shame keeps us from being vulnerable or seen emotionally or spiritually. We fear rejection so shame whispers in your ear, don't say that, hide, cover up, you can't share it. If you've ever wondered why you've heard these stories of men who get go from their job and then they pretend like they're still working for months and their wife doesn't know and they don't tell them, it's because they're ashamed of what happened. So they still get up in the morning, still get dressed and they go out the door and they're hoping to find a new job before their wife even knows because they're ashamed to say what happened. They cover and they hide. And we all have these examples in our own life. Guys, our chance at an Eden marriage goes out the week in Genesis chapter 3. We'll, we'll discover next week why some of you are like, man, why is this so hard then? 
This thing called sin twisted and mangled the pathway of marriage. But God's design is still true for us, even if there's thorns and thistles along the path now. We know we're still called to leave and unite, to become one with one another, to forsake all other people with this person, and to have a nakedness before them and to not be ashamed, which is so much easier said than done. And if you're struggling with any of this in this room right now, just know that this is just scratching the surface. I was joking with people coming in. It's like, if your marriage needs more than 30 minutes, I can't fix you today, right? All of us have more than 30 minutes worth of problems in our marriage. But we actually did a marriage conference back in April called one plus one equals one, God's marriage math. And looking at this idea of what it means to be emotionally, spiritually, and physically one. We have all of those recorded, and you can go to our YouTube page, and you can watch those, and we can send those to you. I talk about emotional oneness, spiritual oneness, and physical oneness like an hour each. It was a three-hour conference. So you can see how this can be really important. But practically today, some of you just need to have really practical and good and maybe even hard conversations about boundaries with your parents. Maybe you need to even radically move towards one another and stop trying to live as individuals. Maybe you need to repent of sin that you've long hid away out of shame and fear. Maybe it's about taking the little daily actions that have your spouse feeling like you don't care, so serving them in them and giving yourself away. What is the bath time routine of your marriage that would mean the world to your spouse if you jumped in and were a part of? Whatever it is, I think we must be honest that the current state of marriages within the church, let alone the world, are not going well. So we don't have the luxury of living without sin, but we do have the example of the scriptures to give us, and we have God's helper, the Holy Spirit, to guide us and lead us, to convict us of sin, to repent and move towards one another. The best we will ever have is a marriage of two sinners that say, I do. But in that, Christ can do a miracle. If we chase after Christ, die to self, and look to serve the other person, to give our life away to our spouse, to our family, we can reclaim a little bit of Eden in our marriage. And I promise you that this kind of marriage can be God's greatest gift, but when it goes sideways, it can feel like a curse. We'll talk more about, like I said, sin next week and shame and its problem. But most importantly, in two weeks, we're going to talk about how Christ undoes sin and undoes shame. We can walk towards one another because Christ is the new and better Adam. I'll say this last. We had a couple share at our marriage conference whose marriage likely should have been divorce. I mean, it was just in a really, really bad state. And by God's grace, they're still together today. Still worshiping this church, still at home together. I, I'm always on team marriage, but I thought, I'm like, there's no way they make it. It was just too far, too much hurt, too much pain. And they just stayed committed to one another. So if you look at your marriage today and think, we ain't gonna make it, it's too little, too late. Maybe if I heard this five years ago, I want you to know that Christ can save even your marriage. He can save anything. He's in the business of bringing beauty out of ashes. He's in the business of making the dead come to life. So do not give up. If you need to come speak with me, please come speak with me. Do not try and walk this road alone. We have the map. We have God's spirit. So let us grab the hand of our spouse and walk together.